This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Well, at least the pandemic version of Christian. The normal one is slimmer and a little huggy with people he doesn't even know all that well. Here's what we got for y'all. Tonight, a federal database is meant to help police departments keep track of officer misconduct and hire better cops. But a newsy investigation found some serious gaps in the system. Plus, even as infection rates nationwide are on the decline, the COVID outlook isn't improving for one group of nurses. But first, here's what you need to know right now. There's growing international support for waiving intellectual property protections on COVID-19 vaccines, with President Biden joining other world leaders who want patents put to the side to speed up vaccine manufacturing worldwide. That probably doesn't sound too interesting, but stick with me, it's a pretty big deal. See, these patents basically give the vaccine creators short-term ownership on production to cover the cost of development and encourage investment, meaning they are making some serious bank right now. Taking that away would give countries access to the recipe, so to speak, to make vaccines on their own. At least 80 developing countries have supported the idea since October, but on Wednesday, the US became the largest, most developed country with leaders publicly supporting the patent suspension. Now, now, other governments previously against the waiver have also come out in support, including France, though the president there says that the waiver alone won't solve the problem, and the chief medical officer of BioNTech agrees. Our manufacturing process involves more than 50,000 steps all of which have to be executed accurately in order to ensure efficacy and safety. On top of those concerns, critics of suspending the patents also argue that the bottleneck of production isn't because of the patents, but more so shortages and scarcity of supply chains. All this debate comes as developing countries are hit by another major COVID wave. According to the World Health Organization, there have been more global cases in the last two weeks than in the first six months of the pandemic. The EU is currently weighing whether or not to support the waiver, but in the end, it's not actually up to the countries to decide. The World Trade Organization has to unanimously agree on the waiver. That could take months, but there is precedent. Back in 2003, WTO members agreed to waive patent rights and allow poorer countries to import generic treatments for HIV and AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. The governor of Florida signed a controversial election bill into law today, live on Fox and Friends, because apparently DeSantis and Fox News are just tight like that. So right now I have what we think is the, the strongest election integrity measures in the country. I'm actually gonna sign it right here. It's gonna take effect. The bill aims to increase election transparency by prohibiting mass mailing of ballots and monitoring drop boxes, among other things. But critics say it will only make it harder for many people to vote. We've talked about this trend before. This year alone, at least 360 bills with restrictive provisions to voting have been introduced in state legislatures across the country. Also today, lawmakers in Texas voted to revamp election laws in the state, including increasing criminal penalties and creating criminal offenses. The governor there has made it a priority to get the bill passed and signed into law. So the bottom line is this, election fraud is unacceptable. And that's exactly why I made it an emergency out in the session. It's worth noting, again, there was no evidence of widespread voter fraud in the 2020 election. That's according to reviews from judges, election officials, independent monitors, and you get the idea. That thorough review of voting in the 2020 election hasn't stopped a private recount from playing out in Arizona right now. And the Justice Department is already throwing up some red flags around it. We say private recount because this recount of Arizona's Maricopa County is not supervised by the Arizona Secretary of State as a recount typically would be. Instead, the Republican-led state Senate there hired private contractors to go through and audit ballots, which apparently they can do. This week, a letter from the Arizona Secretary of State called into question some of the methods in this recount, saying ballots and laptops tracking ballots were left unattended. The folks behind the audit call those claims baseless, but the U.S. Department of Justice says this whole thing is raising some concerns. So far, Senate contractors have only recounted roughly 10% of the county's 2.1 million ballots. The effort is supposed to wrap up by May 14th, but that's not looking likely with the pace they're working at. There's a national background check database of police misconduct that's supposed to be a key tool for police accountability. 
especially in a time when there's such an intense focus on police reform. But it's only as good as the available input, and not all agencies are reporting the names of fired officers. Newsy's Patrick Terpstra discovered federal officers stripped of their badges and guns are not flagged at all. U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CBP, fired four people in 2019, all accused of being part of an offensive secret Facebook group. Mocking the deaths of migrant children. There is a national list of law enforcement officers terminated for misconduct like this, but we learned CBP does not report any of the dozens of agents they fire each year for bad behavior. Everything from mistreating suspects to corruption to engaging in crimes. It's not just CBP. We learned no federal agency is adding names of who they fire to what's known as the National Decertification Index. It's the only nationwide background check reporting system for identifying bad apples in policing. The database provides thousands of police departments a way to check whether a potential new hire has an old record of serious wrongdoing. One out of eight sworn officers in this country is federal, working for an agency such as the FBI, Secret Service, Border Patrol. With no federal agencies naming names to the misconduct registry, that's a lot of people with a gun and power to make arrests who don't have to worry about being blacklisted from another job in law enforcement if they abuse their badge. There are very few checks on that type of behavior. They could absolutely, absolutely be working in another law enforcement agency, probably not for the federal government, but absolutely for a local or state jurisdiction. The database has records of decertified cops in 44 states. They're officers whose actions were so bad a state revoked their certification or license. Yeah. Federal agencies don't decertify their officers, but even though it's called the decertification index, the registry was designed to log all kinds of misconduct reports. In fact, we do have records in there that are not just decertifications. Ari Vidali helped build the system. If a officer is involuntarily terminated or an agent for misconduct, that can go in. A third of all federal officers work for CBP. A spokesperson says they don't share misconduct records with the database because of privacy laws. The Bureau of Prisons, another big federal agency, tells us they actually require permission from a former employee before releasing disciplinary files. U.S. Park Police were among federal officers forcing protesters back outside the White House last summer. The agency doesn't provide information to the database either, but will share disciplinary records with outside departments if they request them. But that assumes fired federal officers are honest about their past when applying for a new job in law enforcement. Now, legislation under consideration in Congress would require federal agencies report officer misconduct in a new database the public could search. The idea passed the House, but the Senate has yet to take it up. We'd like to expand it to every involuntary termination that has ever occurred. Those that are not worthy of the badge do not get a second chance just by wandering into another state and, and raising their hand. Patrick Terpstra, Newsy, Washington. When you're back, we'll put in our multi-part cheat code and zip through some of the biggest trending topics in tech and gaming. The creators of Fortnite ditched the Battle Royale this week to go 1v1 with Apple. We're jumping into the world of lawsuits and gaming with one of our favorite segments, Next Level Speedrun, starting with this. The legal battle between Epic Games and Apple landed in federal court this week, and it's inadvertently turning up a lot of news about the entire gaming industry. In order to make its case against Apple, Epic Games, which is the company behind the wildly popular Fortnite, is giving the court a rare behind the scenes look at how video game companies are run. In one recent testimony, a Microsoft rep revealed that the company has always sold its Xbox consoles at a loss, making their money on games and app purchases instead. The case center on Epic's objections to how Apple ran its iOS app store. Epic claims Apple's restrictions are monopolistic, while Apple argues it has a right to determine how apps are sold on its devices. The trial is expected to last a few more weeks and will likely feature testimony from Apple CEO Tim Cook at some point. Bring popcorn. Wow, 
Well, Ethan Winters, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Months after its very tall vampire lady captivated the internet, Resident Evil Village is set for release this Friday. The latest entry in the long-running horror franchise keeps the tense first-person atmosphere of its predecessor, Resident Evil 7, but with more action and gunplay. Village features protagonist Ethan Winters roaming around a monster-infested European settlement, familiar territory for the series. Reviews on the game have been generally positive, if a bit underwhelmed. The critical consensus seems to be that Village is a good blend of action and horror that still doesn't quite hit the same heights as the series' previous titles. What's more, or the towering presence of Lady Dimitrice is only around for a quarter of the game's 10 hour runtime. Sorry to disappoint everyone. If you're a Switch user, you might have noticed how scarce new Nintendo titles tend to be. Well, good news. Now you can make them yourself. Nintendo's latest announcement is Game Builder Garage, a cartoony game builder engine that lets users stream together a simple video game without writing a line of code. Games about making games have become more widespread in recent years. Just look at the success of Roblox or the innovations of Media Molecule's Dreams Project. Even Nintendo's dabbled in user-generated content with its Super Mario Maker line of games, which lets you design your own nightmarish Mario level. Any aspiring designers should have a pretty big potential audience on the Nintendo Switch. The company recently revealed it sold close to 29 million Switch units over the last fiscal year. Listen, people needed something to do during the pandemic. Today is National Nurses Day, a day to recognize the contributions of these healthcare workers who've been an invaluable part of our fight against COVID-19, but their work has been dangerous and for some, even deadly. Newsy's Kat Sandoval tells us that even at this point in the pandemic, a small population of nurses who are Filipino have more than a quarter of COVID-related nurse deaths. Without national data, it was hard for the Filipino community to make sense of the number of deaths they were seeing. For the past year, Grace Rugliano and a team of volunteers have been meticulously collecting photographs and stories for an online memorial called Kanlungan. Nurses don't want to be called heroes. They want to have support. They want to have PPE. I think the hardest part is really knowing that a lot of your colleagues and, and your community members are not surviving or are not doing well or, or getting sick. The union National Nurses United is one of the few organizations tracking the number of nurses' deaths. Filipinos make up an estimated 4% of the nursing population, but 26% of nurses' deaths due to COVID-19 and related complications. We talk about health disparities for our patients. It's very different and scary to talk about the health disparities amongst our coworkers. Of all the nurses of color who have died from COVID-19 in the U.S., Filipino nurses make up by far the largest share. The conversation is only happening amongst the Filipino community. It wasn't happening amongst healthcare workers at large. Behind the statistics are real people. It puts faces on the numbers. We've heard, you know, just a lot of um, gratefulness that their family member's name is memorialized somewhere and that somebody's talking about that sacrifice. Filipino nurses tend to work in 24-7 inpatient care settings with high stress and long work hours like the ICUs. And because there are a lot of Filipino immigrant nurses, some are less likely to complain or feel like they can't speak up when faced with stressful or dangerous work environments. Nurse Rosa Morton felt like their stories, especially about immigrant nurses, weren't being captured. There are uh, more to it than the statistics, more to it than the jobs. And like these are these are migrants who are who have ups and downs in their lives. So she took photographs of their work and homes, a snapshot of their lives. But the job can be exhausting. And we are getting tired again, not just physically. We're getting tired emotionally and morally. For Newsy, I'm Kat Sandoval. We're gonna take a quick break. When you're back, more ITL. For years, we've been hearing about families separated at the US border. Basically, the federal government separately detaining or deporting members of the same family that might've come to the US seeking asylum or just better opportunities. 
But this week saw a very different development for the first time. The same families reunited on behalf of the government. Newsy's Ben Shaviso has some context on footage that gives us an up close look at that. This is the moment Sandra Ortiz sees her son, Brian, in person for the first time in more than three years. <laughs> Theirs is one of thousands of families who were separated under a Trump administration policy meant to deter illegal border crossings. It feels like a dream, like I was in the car and I was just like, this is finally happening. <laughs> Later that same night, Keldi Mabel Gonzalez, a mother from Honduras, surprised her sons, Mino and Eric, at a family gathering. <laughs> the families are among the first to be reunited by organizations working with the Biden administration. The videos taken by advocates and immigration lawyers who helped organize the reunions. They've been tracking down the hundreds of parents, the majority of them living in Mexico and Central America, in the years after the family separations took place, the Biden White House says the Trump administration left it with little to no information about the families. We are addressing the many, many more families that need to be reunified. Other challenges include parents living in remote regions, some of them hiding from the gangs they were trying to escape when they fled to the U.S. with their children. Others are suspicious of strangers or may speak only indigenous languages. More than a thousand families remain separated, with the Biden administration saying dozens will be reunited in the next few weeks. Advocates are fighting for all families who were separated to be granted permanent U.S. residency as compensation for their trauma. Ben Chamiso, Newsy. If you've ever spent time in Charleston, South Carolina in the summer, you know it can get pretty hot and the good food and cocktails don't offer much of a reprieve. The city is under a so-called heat watch, a designation for places that have experienced rising temperatures over the years, especially in the summer. National reporter Mayad Rodriguez says the goal is to help city planners better mitigate the effects of intense heat that can be deadly. The hallmarks of summer, the shining sun and stifling heat and humidity. And no one knows heat and humidity quite like the South. Yeah, it is getting hotter, absolutely. Mark Wilbert is a senior policy advisor on resilience for the mayor's office in Charleston, South Carolina, a place that's no stranger to hot summers. First answer for many people in the South, it's always hot in Charleston or it always floods in Charleston, you know? Um, but we are beginning to pe see people say it's really hot. But just how hot is it getting? This summer, the Centers for Disease Control, NOAA, and the National Weather Service, among others, will conduct a new national study looking at urban heat islands to find out. But we're really going to focus on that heat inequality. Does that exist in our city? If it does, then what kind of steps can we take to begin to make changes? In addition to Charleston, South Carolina, the study is also taking place in 10 other states across the country, in places like New York, Atlanta, Albuquerque, New Mexico, San Diego, and Kansas City, Missouri, along with communities in Indiana and Virginia, among others. This study won't just involve trained scientists, it will also involve so-called citizen scientists who will drive around many neighborhoods for many square miles measuring the heat. Over at the Citadel, a military college in Charleston, Lieutenant Colonel Scott Curtis monitors data from this outdoor weather station every day. With Charleston being surrounded on all sides by water, we have really high humidities as well. He will also be gathering volunteers to measure heat for the nationwide study. And we're going to get a lot of good data that's going to be helpful for uh, understanding extreme heat. Heat that can also impact the military and its service members. With a lot of the training that goes on, uh, you know, they're, they're exposed to heat. And so we have to understand um, just how hot it can get and what that does to the body, you know, what, what's, what the stress level is going to be. Critical information about handling heat in a warming world. In Charleston, South Carolina, I'm Maya Rodriguez. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. Do's, let me know what you all think about the show. We love feedback. Don'ts, if you say anything about my makeup application, I'm going to scream.
A federal judge recently struck down a ban on evicting tenants who struggled to pay rent during the pandemic. The Biden administration has said they'll appeal the ruling. To give you a sense of scope, nearly 6 million households are behind on rent, and the nation's rent debt is more than $19 billion. National reporter Stephanie Stone says that data comes from a partnership that wants to highlight the economic and racial inequities of rent debt and then get rid of it. This is San Diego, California. My name is Janaya Paul Wall. And this is Janaya Wall, joining forces with tenants' rights advocates who are fighting eviction. ACE, or the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment, shared this video with us. They're working to protect people like Janaya, who they believe are falling victim to loopholes in rent relief laws. Then to be given a 60 day to get out, uh, retaliation because I asked someone to do what is right by law, what the law requires a landlord to do. Janaea has been through a lot. Her medical disabilities and complications are just one more stress on top of joblessness and a pandemic. The cycle that you go through trying to process what to do next. You can barely do your day-to-day -day functions when you're trying to worry about, am I going to have a roof? Is somebody going to lock me out? Is somebody going to come out? Is all my stuff going to be on the, on the street? There are many others like Janaea. Now, organizations like Policy Link and the Tableau Foundation are trying to shine a light on the economic and racial inequities of rent debt. What we provide are indicators of equity around income inequality, housing affordability, and we provide those indicators very deeply broken down by race, by ethnicity, by gender, so that we are empowering community leaders and policymakers with data to design effective policies. Sarah Truhaft, Vice President of Research at Policy Link, says their data now spans across most of the country. She says rent debt is a pressing an urgent issue. There's a huge risk of a massive amount of eviction, and that would be a humanitarian crisis. It would be an economic disaster for our communities. It would be a public health disaster as well. As for Janaea, she's doing okay for now. She's applied for assistance and she's made her voice loud on purpose. Fight to be heard. Fight to get your issues in front of the right people. Fight. Uh, organize. Don't just go for the okie doke. Don't, oh, we can't do this. No, don't take no for an answer. Fight until you get your resolve. She wants others to know they're not alone in the fight. I'm Stephanie Stone reporting. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back next week with more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories for news here. Headed your way right now.